first uh, first hooded knife wielding uh, person to appear in the background on the New Brunswick Archaeology podcast, <laughs> basically. Yeah. We've never had a murder on this. <laughs> that, that, that'd be a real crossover, right? The murder pod is like a true serious crime. Yeah, true crime. The true, true crime, crime happening while recording the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. We'd be celebrities and you'd be toast. Be... Yeah. I do it for the podcast. <laughs> Thank you for your... <laughs> Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, featuring your hosts, Gabe Ryan and Ken Holyoke. Welcome back to New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. I'm Gabe Reinick, and I'm in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and I'm joined, as I am every fortnight or so, by Ken Holyoke, who is not in a Chili's. He is in his home studio in Lethbridge, Alberta. How are you, Ken? Coming to you live from Studio 598. Uh... Is that what we're calling it now? I think that's what I called it before, wasn't it? Oh, maybe. I don't know. Is, is, is that? You'll notice there's no no baffling up tonight. No, there's no baffling. Listener, the the listener may notice that someone here. Ken seems to have a little bit of a cold. He's assured us it's not COVID nineteen. Um, it's just a just a little bit of a cough. Um, so if his ordinarily dulcet tones are not what they sometimes are, um, that's what it is. And if and if I'm talking more than usual, that is, if I'm able to sneak in more than usual, it's because Ken has had to mute himself. To just have a hacking coughing um, fit, and uh, and I'll carry it from there. But we um, we are sponsored as we are uh, every fortnight by the Associations of Professional Archaeologists of New Brunswick, and uh, they still don't have a website. We still don't have a website, but there's going to be a website someday, and listener, you will be among the first to know about it. And and I think and, we're we're jumping ahead here, Gabe. We we forgot to inform the listeners that they are listening to episode one of season two. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. And so we, we've now like entered a, the second season of the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. We have. Um, we understand that uh, that our friends thought we might only last three shows, and our enemies thought we might last two seasons. So here we are, enemies. We've, we've lasted. <laughs> uh, no, Ken, Ken is such a winsome guy. He couldn't possibly have any any enemies as he hacks and smiles uh, sort of alarmingly into the into the microphone. <laughs> and um, so, uh, but one of the things is, as we roll in, to um, season two, listener, is that we had a series of really excellent prize availabilities um, during season one. If if we'd found if someone had hit on the perfect name for this show, um, but that uh, the money is still on the table, as they say in Atlantic City, and um, and uh, so we have uh, we're still looking for a new name for this podcast. And Ken, if the if the listener had a new name for this podcast, where would they email it to? They would be emailing to New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com. New Brunswick Archaeology, all one word, A R C H A E O L O G Y, New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com. And if they were the winner uh, this uh, fortnight, if they renamed the podcast, what would they receive? Well, so Gabe, have you noticed a nip in the air lately? You were at. So it's a little crisp here in Fredericton. Yeah, you were at Common Ground last week, right? It was, but it wasn't as cold as when we've gone together. I was going to say, I remember a rather frosty night uh, uh, during <laughs> doing night safety, uh, uh, the midnight shift at Common Ground one year. And uh, it was around this time of year, you know, it's a time of year when the Blue Jays are kind of making us think that they might be a playoff team. And when Leafs fans, my, myself and among them, practice a renewal rite of cognitive dissonance by reciting the line, this is our year, over and over again. Yes, listener. We don't just cover archaeology and food, but we're well tuned to the sports world and the culture of the day. But all this means, you know, I'll, I'll put this aside, the days are getting shorter. Nights are getting longer. I believe the ad campaign for New Brunswick Pride Alpine used to go. It's this time of year that I think Scandinavians have perfected the kind of lifestyle we all strive for. Are you familiar with Huga, Gabe? Huga, yeah. You, you are? Yeah. Well, the Danes didn't just introduce the three-age system and influence shell heap archaeology. They put into one word the concept and feeling of curling up beside a warm fire and just being cozy, which I think we all feel this time of year. And in these times of high costs for all, one thing we can take solace in is comfort, right? So this prize tonight gets into this true spirit of Huga. So you're going to dust off your plaids and your toques, because the New Brunswick Archaeology podcast is offering one lucky listener, the one to rename this podcast, in fact, and as always, please email your suggestion, 
we're offering you, listener, a weekend retreat with the finest of comforts. A roaring fire, a log cabin in the lower reaches of the Wastug in NB wine country, sweaters crafted by the hands of maritime Canadian senior citizens, and of course, the company of your hosts and for weekend entertainment. You'll be whisked to the rustic and enchanting log cabin at Ridgeback Lodge in Kingston Peninsula, where we're going to spend three days and two nights imbibing on glog and great northerns, eating warm, hearty meals of slow-cooked meats and vegetables, preparing your favorite version of smorebrod, and snacking on delights like bland selfslick and eye blue ski rur. Evenings can be found by a campfire, <laughs> being uncom- uncomfortably comfy under an HBC blanket, trying to boil yourself like a lobster in one of their lovely Japanese hot tubs, or relaxing with one of those mulled beverages. The wine, of course, one of the earthy and bold selections from the nearby Dunham's Run Estate Winery. While we play archaeologically themed board games like Foragers or Carcassonne. During the day, we'll take guided hikes and breathe in the beauty of nature and fallen leaves and enjoy topical lectures from yours truly. By Sunday, you'll awaken with a renewed sense of fulle se for frisco and return to your life <laughs> ready to face the fall and all that winter has in store for us. I think we've lost all of our Danish listeners right there. <laughs> uh, well, Ken, Ken this, this prize sounds so good as you were reading it. As soon as you mentioned the roaring fire, I heard four four paws hit the floor as my main coon cat rushed to his computer to try to send in the winning entry. <laughs> so, uh, Ken, if if Elwood, uh, if Elwood or any of our other listeners would like to submit the the winning, uh, the Hugo winning uh, uh, prize uh, for this uh, this this fortnight, where would they send that? They would send that to New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail dot com. Oh, New Brunswick Archaeology, all one word at gmail dot com. That's right, listener. Don't get caught out in the cold when you could be cozy uh, in interior New Brunswick in front of the fire. And Ken, what else is in that mailbox? Well, we have uh, we got a couple emails here. One of them is uh, our friend Michael from Vermont uh, sent a congratulations uh, uh, for Dr. Holio. Congratulations on the recent milestone of your PhD. Your conversation about the use of the honorific, including Gabe's comments about the kind of doctor who doesn't help people, And your note about your MD sister being the real Dr. Holyoke made me think of a favorite movie in the 1970s and a scene from which I found a clip online. And so he sent me a clip for uh, a scene in the courtroom of the movie What's Up, Doc, where uh, 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 and I'll, I'll send the clip afterwards. But the scene involves a stuffy British professor who invokes the honorific before a judge who questions him with a doctor of what? And when the prof says music has a snappy comeback. I happen to be a doctor of music and have always remembered this when dealing with colleagues who perhaps thought a little too much of themselves. If you don't know this movie, I highly recommend it. Great cast, including co-stars Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill, Madeline Kahn and others. Includes a wild car chase scene through the streets of San Francisco, a classic case of mixed up luggage and identities, a parody of an academic conference and more. Congratulations again. Congratulations again. I continue to enjoy your podcast and coincidentally just passed through Eastern NB returning from a great week on Cape Breton. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you for the congratulations. Really appreciate that. And uh, I did enjoy the clip. Thank you for sending that. I'll, I'll share that with Gabe here later today. We should maybe throw that in the show notes for that. Yeah, we will show that, throw that in the show notes. Well, thanks very Um, much, Michael. Yeah, thank you. And some communication about getting our previous prize winner. Um, a lot of garbage email from Reddit, um, and uh, and I think actually that brings us to the end of the mailbox, but also brings us to the fact that also in the mail, we uh, we've had another draw, and we have had another prize draw for some sweet EcoForce swag. Is that right? That is correct. And lo and behold, we are joined by the president of the Association of President of Professional Archaeologists of New Brunswick and Eco4 uh employee extraordinaire Trevor Dow. Uh good evening Trevor. Welcome to yep. the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, he may be an Eco4 in British Columbia, but he's an Eco eight and a half or a nine in New Brunswick as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait until I get my uh New Brunswick tuxedo on. I might push yeah, yeah. over the nine mark there. How are you, hey, Trevor? I'm well, I'm well. I'm dialing in, coincidentally, uh, from one of those Japanese-fired hot tubs um, from the Kingston Peninsula. I can't recommend it enough. Well, that's great. Um, if if there's anyone, you you are perhaps the most hooga person in this department. 
<laughs> when I think Huga, I think Trevor Dow. Yeah. So um so Trevor, we heard we heard um great reviews on your um on the the lucky uh, listener last fortnight, Jillian was very pleased and your backpack arrived just in time for um the hurricane that hit Halifax. Yeah. But um if there's any ever a time that you need a waterproof eco four backpack, that is the time. <laughs> I would Good agree. promo too, but uh, as long as it keeps the computer dry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Although, although she did suggest that you want to be a little careful on the bottom. The bottom is not as waterproof as the top. Oh, so I haven't um, had any. I haven't had those issues. Maybe these. Maybe these ones are not quite uh, up to snuff. Yeah. I well, know. I assume once Ken and I get ours, we'll let you know how they um, how they hold up. So um, yeah, I uh, checked the tracking on those, and they look like they got rerouted through someplace and just outside of singapore um so it could be a little while well ken was just, oh we're not supposed to talk about that okay ken's not outside <laughs> of singapore i said sorry sorry <laughs> um so so listener um trevor dow is currently um we've actually suspended him from the ceiling here at um at uh new brunswick archaeology podcast uh headquarters he's in in the athletic facility we maintain here and he's in a feather boa and what we're going to do here, for copyright reasons, you're not going to be able to hear this, but there's going to be um, really blasting prog rock in just a second here. Um, and we're going to lower Trevor down on this this sort of winch system we have. And he's going to come screaming in. And as he comes screaming in, he's going to land. And he is going to say the name um, of the lucky prize draw this week. So, so Trevor is strapping in. The feathers are there. Okay, Trevor, we're going to throw the we're going to throw the switch here. Music is on. It's uh, uh, we can't tell you even what it is because it's that copyright protected. Okay, yeah, ladies, eight and a half minutes have passed. We have the song is wrapping up, and and look, and there's Trevor. There's Trevor right now. Look out! Nice landing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, and who is our lucky winner, Trevor? Ah, one of uh, my former students and yours, Ms. Emily Gosling. Congratulations! Congratulations, Congratulations Emily. Emily. For Emily, we have one of these uh, sweet uh, Eco Four branded trowels. Oh, those are great! Uh, as well those as those come pretty uh, sharpened, Trevor. Or does she have to sharpen that herself? No, she's gonna have to sharpen that herself. I, I right, recommend. To do that in field school? Uh, yeah, I recommend uh, uh, a good edge grinder. Uh, yeah, yep. yeah, or a Dremel. Dremel works well too. Yeah, we could get uh, customized uh, bastard files for the New Brunswick Archaeology podcast. Oh Ken, yeah, this I is mean, a, the thing about New- this is an all ages podcast. I don't think you can say that. Well, the thing about New Brunswick archaeology is we all have a bastard file. It's just that some of us also have a file in our toolkit, you know. So it's a, uh, it's like a burn book, but it's even more. Uh... <laughs> uh, some of us have multiple ones. Yeah, and that's a Marshalltown travel with the Eagle Four logo on it. Uh, that folks. is, as well as uh, a hat, and I got a whole pile of stickers here that I'm going to throw into you. So Emily, Excellent. I will uh, leave those in my mailbox in the department for you, perhaps to pick up. I'll send you an email. So yeah, send send an email because I think Emily may have graduated. So I don't know. Oh if, yes, you could be correct. Yep, yeah. it's possible. The um, so we have uh, her contact Trevor... info too, so we can reach out to her and let her know that she's won and uh, put her in touch with the uh, with the mailman. Perfect. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Trevor, could you just give us a quick rundown again? Um, your company is Eco Four. What do you all do? We do a little bit of everything: uh, archaeological consulting, natural resources consulting, uh, unnatural resources consulting, unnatural resources consulting. Sometimes we summon the dead. Um, but, um, yeah, we're, uh, we're a, a full service, uh, um, environmental company working, uh, I like to refer to it as bi-coastal, uh, yep. we're yep. occupying both of the coasts. Cool. Um, but yeah, that's us. Fantastic. And you are, uh, what's your title? Are you a senior archeologist? What's your official? Yeah, that's, that's, that's me. I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You've been doing it long enough. You're not a junior archeologist anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as yeah, I just, I don't, I don't care about labels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Except that one that's been seared on the Eagle Four trial and that is on those backpacks that were headed to Singapore and now are headed to Canada, my offices, right? That's right. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. Fantastic. Exactly. Well, congratulations, Emily, uh, or sorry. Uh, yeah. Congratulations, yeah, Emily. Emily. Yeah. And, um, and we will be, uh, those will be in the mail soon. Yeah. And, uh, or in, in your mailbox soon. We'll figure this out. <laughs> and, uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Eco Four. Um, and, and Trevor, if uh, the listener wants to check out your website, uh, what's eco Four's website? It's just eco4.ca, E-C-O-F-O-R. And uh, yeah, we've got lots of uh, great stuff on there. And we're actually um, still hiring people on the West Coast. If you're on the West Coast or interested in working on the West Coast. West of the Coast, Rockies. 
uh, on the air. Before his last <laughs> you're exactly <laughs> west of the Rockies, you're on the air. Uh, um, so you're still hard, you're hiring for the fall. Yes, we have uh, still have a ton of work on the books. Um, some really interesting stuff. Um, We've got crews actually working in uh, in um, Yukon right now. Yeah, you know, you, you know, there, there's no place finer to spend a Canadian autumn than the Yukon. I've always heard. There's not, but I'll tell you. You know, you could have the chance to work on a, uh, a potentially very very old site. But oh, yeah, interesting. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, as the old, um, I think it's the Ian Tyson song goes, uh, "Get there before the snow flies." The weather's good there in the fall, so exactly. Um, exactly. You could turn it with. Uh, you might get a, a, a DCMA on that one. <laughs> yeah, we might. Well, that's why the Ian Tyson version is probably in the public domain. Just Neil Young's going to sue me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. Uh, all right. Well, thanks, Trevor. Um, uh, it's good to see you. And we'll have you on here at some point for a big CRM roundup, I think. Sounds good. All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks, thanks Trevor. See, see you later. So, listener, we've got a special treat today. We are joined um, in Montreal by Emily Drakeo. And Emily Drakeo is a recent graduate from the University of New Brunswick MA in History program, where she did a thesis on uh, Black loyalists here in New Brunswick. So Emily, we were wondering if you could, I've given you that brief intro. I've ignored that you were our beloved TA on the field school <laughs> uh, daddies for our <laughs> listeners have heard you before. I've ignored that your thesis went over so swimmingly that um, we essentially sat around for a few minutes while I was on your committee and said, uh, I, I believe one of the comments actually when we were sitting around the committee was one of the committee members said, do we have an option for like pass plus? <laughs> and was, <laughs> so, uh, so, but uh, we wanted to have you in because uh, your thesis is really one of the only um, recent works to deal with this, maybe one of the only works to deal with this topic in New Brunswick. But before we get to that, uh, we wondered if you could tell us a little bit about uh, your background, how you got into archaeology, and who you are. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast this week. So as Gabe said, I just finished my master's degree in history at the University of New Brunswick, and I did my bachelor's degree in anthropology and art history at McGill University. And at first I was just in art history, and then I got hired as a undergraduate research assistant for one of my professors in anthropology. And that's when I decided to kind of double major um, because he took me to India to work at an archaeological field school and I fell in love with it so that's kind of how my passion for archaeology started and then my passion for the topic of slavery studying slavery in Canada started a bit later on in my undergraduate degree with uh, Dr. Charmaine Nelson who was my co-supervisor for my thesis that I'm going to be talking about today and she uh, taught a class on the visual culture of slavery and asked us all if we knew that Canada had participated in the Atlantic slave trade and I sat amongst hundreds of students in that class who, like myself, didn't know that that was a thing. Um, so I grew up in Quebec and um, I never learned about Canadian slavery. So I kind of started to research it more and noticed that there's also a lack of archaeology on the topic. And that's kind of how I merged my two interests together. So archaeology on one hand and then Canadian slavery on the other. That's great. Um, yeah, and that's so great. Um, your uh, your thesis, what's the title of your thesis? Excavating Archives, Mapping Enslaved People and Locating Their Living Quarters in New Brunswick's Loyalist Landscape. Excellent. And as you said, that's that's supervised by Charmaine Nelson and Stephanie Hunt Kennedy, a dear colleague of mine here at the University of New Brunswick over in history. And we were wondering if you could just give us kind of a general overview of the institution of slavery here in the Maritimes. Because I think as you as you indicated, this is not something that people immediately associate Canada with. Like Canada's supposed to be the um, it's the last stop on the Underground Railroad. It's not supposed to be um yeah. a site of enslavement and could you just sort of give us an overview of it yeah for sure and that's exactly how it's um taught in schools as well like you just said kind of just the underground railroad so when slavery began in canada um it started really during the 1600s so enslaved people the, the, the first enslaved person um was a little boy from madagascar who was brought over to new france at the time canada when it was still new france and um, he was enslaved, given um, a Christian name and baptized. And then slavery started to grow kind of at a slow pace um, during the period of the French Empire in Canada. And it started to kind of, uh, I would say, grow, get larger or become more popularized um, 
a bit later on when Canada shifted from just extraction to settlement. So as more um, colonizers started to settle in Canada, what happened was they were like, oh, we need more labor. There's not enough labor. So they requ uh, requested to the king of France at the time, King Louis XIV, um, if they could start importing enslaved people from Africa. And at first he was hesitant. He was like, oh, no, it's too cold for uh, enslaved people from Africa to live in Canada. They're just going to die. Um, and then they used the comparison of uh, the U.S. North, so New England, um, and said, well, enslaved people there are doing fine and they're from Africa. So let's just do it. Um, not in those words exactly, but just the gist of it. And then uh, so black slavery started to grow. And then, of course, when uh, the British conquered uh, the French in Canada and took over uh, the Canadian territory, slavery continued. Um, and in the maritime specifically, we see a lot of enslaved people coming following the influx of loyalists. So following the Revolutionary War, um, loyal, white loyalists are bringing enslaved people to New Brun what became New Brunswick in 1784, which was part of Nova Scotia. So New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, um, PEI, there's also in Atlantic Canada at large, there's also enslaved people uh, in Newfoundland, which is another under-researched um, area. Very interesting. Yeah, uh, very under-researched area. Um, and... So, yeah, so there were at the same time as Black enslaved people in the Maritimes, there was also Indigenous enslaved people, and that's very important to remember as well. So these slaveries were happening at the same time. And then there's also um, Il Royal, which is in Nova Scotia, which was a hub for, or uh, near where Lewisburg is, which was also a hub for um, enslaved people during the French Empire and continued to be so um, when the English took over. So that's kind of how slavery how enslaved people kind of got to the Maritimes and to Canada at large, because we're talking mainly about Ontario, Quebec, um, and east, more east, like east onwards. So then New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, uh, PEI, and so on. Um, and then the practice of slavery was, I don't know if you want me to get into the labor that they were doing just yet. I don't know if that's jumping the gun. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because ahead. I, I yeah. think one of my one of our questions, Ken and I both had a question here about the, we were curious if you could maybe frame that just in, in contrast, I think, with the slavery that our listener might be most familiar with, which mm -hmm. is sort of Southern plantation slavery, I think. Yeah. Now um, that would be kind of illustrative, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's a great way to frame it as well in that context. So instead of having monocrop plantations as in the South or in the Caribbean uh, or in South America, so you're thinking of like tobacco, coffee, uh, cotton, indigo, uh, rice, so all those types of plantations. Canada, the climate could not sustain monocrop plantations, so they could not sustain um, a plantation where they were only growing coffee or tobacco. And a listener so, will know about the Canadian climate that Emily is in a, a rather <laughs> large sweater right now as, as yeah. she sits comfortably <laughs> in Montreal and, and, and in a recently moved apartment and I think is, is still perhaps, you know, wondering where the uh, the turn up on the on the heater is. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. um, it's cold here and you can't sustain year round crops either. So you can't grow. Um, so wheat was popular, growing wheat was popular in Canada, but you couldn't grow that year round. So there wasn't as much as a market for monocrop plantations. So what were enslaved people doing instead? Well, they were multi-occupational. So they were doing domestic labor. They were working uh, inside the houses of their enslavers. They were doing outdoor field labor, whether that be um, taking, um, planting crops, but diverse crops, or um, taking care of animals, building a shed, um, so on and so forth. And then they're also taking part in running errands for their enslavers. So leaving the so-called, if you want to say plantation, I say more like site of enslavement or um, their enslavers' uh, estate. So they're leaving their enslavers' estate and they're doing errands for them, whether that be going to the market and selling the produce of their labor so sometimes you know they're just growing a mixture of things or fishing they're also fishing so they were doing more multi-occupational labor and you do see that still in the south um but in canada it was more as a response to the cold weather as well as to um economic uh demand so what was needed at the time so when the loyalists came to the maritimes they were also settling so they didn't have houses already built so the enslaved people were helping, uh, were being forced to build those houses um, for their enslavers. Um, so it's just a bit of a contrast between the South 
and the North, and also when you think of um, how the violence inflicted against enslaved people was also a bit different. So there was no, in no, uh, New Brunswick, there was no laws upholding or denouncing slavery. It was kind of ambiguous at the time. Um, so there were uh, habeas corpus, which are freedom cases that were brought to the court in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Some were successful, some weren't successful. And enslavers and enslaved people used this kind of ambiguity to their advantages in different ways. Um, but there's also differences between, uh, they were like in all systems of the institution of Atlantic slavery, there was physical, sexual, and psychological abuse happening, but it might not be the same way that we imagine it, or we have studied it happening in the South. So a hundred, a hundred lashes. That doesn't mean that it wasn't happening uh, in different ways, but also thinking of how the climate, I talk about this in my thesis, like how the climate was used against enslaved people. So because it was so cold, how enslaved people were being forced to work outside in the cold as a form yeah. of abuse, as opposed to um, uh, beating somebody. Um, so there are differences in those respects as well. So in your in your thesis, one of the things you talked about, which I thought was was really uh, insightful, was you you talked about a little bit about this legal framework for the institution of slavery um, in the Maritimes, and I wondered if you could. This idea of a of a legally ambiguous slavery is sort of fascinating, and I wonder if you could elaborate just a little bit more on on that. So, sort of, how does this happen that that loyalists show up in New Brunswick and then have still have slaves mm -hmm. or enslaved people? Yeah, so that for sure, it's a really interesting uh, question. So, I and and it's also different uh, between provinces as well. So um, Barry Cahill, who writes about Nova Scotia, and then there's um, David Bell, who writes about New Brunswick, about uh, the legality of slavery during the Loyalist era in those two provinces. And essentially, when Loyalists came to Canada, there was a clause saying that, uh, almost encouraging them to bring enslaved people. I can't remember exactly what the clause says, I can find it in like the constitution, like when they were writing the clause, but it essentially said something along the lines of um, bring your family, bring your possession. You have like one bag of possessions each that you can bring and you can bring, of course, they use the a different term than black enslaved person, um, but they say, bring your enslaved person. I think it's either free of charge and then, or you pay for the enslaved person, but then the possessions that they are their possessions that they're carrying, which are most likely that of their enslavers, is free. So there was a clause saying that you can bring enslaved people, but within Canada, other than in um, Ontario, which was at the time uh, Lower Canada. No, which was at the time Upper Canada. Yeah. It, it, it continues to consider itself Upper Canada in my experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, which was uh, Upper Canada at the time. So in, I'm getting a bit of a tangent, but in Upper Canada, there was uh, an anti-slavery law, which was stating, oh, um, after the age of 25, um, enslaved people born to enslaved mothers would be freed. And this was, I can find exactly, but I think it was in like 1793-ish that this was passed, but there was no equivalent uh, passed in uh, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. I kind of grouped those two together since they were both part of the same province at one time. Yeah, cool. and, and, there yeah, and they were sort of treated, they were treated as property chattels basically exactly right, that they were brought along like with all your other processions basically yeah. exactly and then um there was also no like when you think of slavery under the uh, french empire there was le connoir which was um rules to follow on how to enslave black people so there was um that was happening in france and in, in france and in the french empire was it being implemented while Canada was a part of the French Empire. It's not really clear, and scholars talk about this a lot. So that's something that research is still happening, uh, is still going on. Um, but in New Brunswick, this loyalists were trying to uphold slavery. So there were loyalists who were putting forth bills saying, "Let's make slavery legal," because we have all of these habeas corpus, so freedom cases, like I said before, coming forth, um, and we might be losing our so-called property. Um, and most of the judges ruled either they couldn't come to a decision or they ruled for slavery, but there was still no bill passed because there was kind of this 
tension between the loyalists who are running the public offices versus uh, the sort of everyday people, you could say. And loyalists, uh, what David Bell argues in his article on uh, loyalist, slave, loyalist slavery and the law is that loyalists in New Brunswick are trying to recreate this social uh, structure that they had in the past when they were living in the South or in the American North. Um, they were trying to implement this hierarchy that they felt was lacking in New Brunswick. So they were trying to do this by implementing these bills. Whereas in Nova Scotia, you could kind of see something different happening where the judges there are ruling more often uh, in fa favor of the enslaved people. So people were being granted their freedom more. Um, so it was kind of not just, oh, slavery's done, emancipation's happened one day, one year. It was more in no uh, Nova Scotia, at least a gradual emancipation. That's what Barry Cowell calls it. So it's kind of a slow emancipation of individual enslaved people that kind of builds up um, and culminates to the emancipation of slavery throughout the British Empire in 1834. So what do you so, attribute that that process to being a bit slower in Nova Scotia than in New Brunswick? I'm I'm curious. Um in New sorry, in Nova Scotia it was a bit more um it was like a progressive change over time. I think I wasn't clear, sorry. It was a progressive change over time, whereas in New Brunswick, enslaved people were not being granted their freedom as often. So it was kind of this weird limbo still. Oh, I there, see. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know if that was I'm I was talking about too many things at once, but oh no no! This is, I so I admit Emily, most of what I know about this topic is from your thesis, so yeah. uh, so so I'm totally vulnerable to whatever whatever you want to whatever you want to tell me. And and you brought up something, and I and something I read in your thesis that I I um you talked about indigenous enslavement in New mm -hmm. France. Um, and so what were it's not the topic of your th thesis, but can you tell us a little bit about what how indigenous enslavement was working at the same time? Yeah. So in um, prior to the Loyalist influx, so when Canada was still part of uh, the French Empire, uh, this is primarily what was happening in what we call now Quebec, the province of Quebec, uh, was Indigenous enslavement. So in um, Marcel Trudel, I have his books on my my bookshelf over there but in uh his book it's in a box right now it's okay exactly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no the, the listener will know that, that take Emily out just, our books <laughs> yeah the listener will know that Emily just gestured towards an entire wall of leather-bound volumes <laughs> yeah very tastefully adorning the wall <laughs> yeah um yeah so in uh, Marcel Trudel's books he talks about um enslavement specifically in um Quebec and New France, and the majority of enslaved people. So there was 4,000-ish enslaved people um, he, throughout the French parts of Canada. And two-thirds of those enslaved people were Indigenous, and only one-third were Black from uh, his archival research. And um, they were referred to as uh, Pawnee. And uh, enslavement of Indigenous people, they actually, according to Marcel Trudel, had a lower life expectancy. So it was about 17 or 18 for Indigenous enslaved people versus 25 for Black enslaved people. And the argument that he's made and other scholars have made was that Black enslaved people were considered this rare luxury good or object that they not necessarily treated better, but that they used more as domestic enslaved people. So when they would have guests coming over, um, instead of having an indigenous enslaved person be serving them, it would be a black enslaved person because they were considered more expensive, um, more like luxurious. a status thing. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's interesting because um, most of the books that I've come across that are about indigenous enslavement in Canada um, during the period of the Atlantic slave trade uh, talk about Indigenous slavery in Quebec and also in Ontario, but I haven't um, come across much about Indigenous enslavement during the Loyalist influx, at least, in New Brunswick. Um, okay, and I think that also, I kind of like, this was something I like, didn't know, I like, tiptoed maybe around in my thesis, was also not to just assume that enslaved people that were brought by loyalists were necessarily black unless it was explicitly said so um because i mean in uh, in, in in census records even today like they'll just mark someone as white if they think they look white or someone black if they think they look black someone you know so there's also right. this 
weird uh, usage of terms happening. So I tried to be careful of that, but most of the time they were explicitly uh, mentioned as black um, from the loyalists who are bringing them in. But that's something that I want to tap into a bit more because I haven't come across many archival sources that are talking specifically about indigenous people uh, enslaved during the period of like this loyalist influx in the Maritimes. Yeah, that's a fascinating topic. And so could you give us just a sense of how many enslaved people we're talking about in New Brunswick um, and the time period that your thesis specifically mm -hmm. considered? Yeah, so um, yeah, so I kept on saying like the lo loyalist era, but I think I should clarify that. Don't so worry, Emily, this is yeah. with Ken. I, I sit here and, and all of a sudden I'm like, Ken, uh, could you, you've mis mentioned a fairly obscure rock. Could you perhaps uh, <laughs> cue us in on what this all is? Uh, we we, so we have, the listeners should be familiar though. Uh, we, we did kind of do a broad overview of historical archaeology in New Brunswick and, I, and and we did give some dates for the Loyalist period. So this awesome. is just a rehash for them. That's so a, it, to rehash. But it would definitely help the listener by which we mean Ken and me if you give us some specific <laughs> dates. Yeah. yeah. So to rehash for everybody then. So um, the time period I'm talking about is 1783 to 1834. So 1783 being when loyalists, uh, there was a loyalist influx. Uh, so a lot of loyalists were um, leaving their homes behind in the U.S. They wanted to remain loyal to the British and they came to Canada. Specifically, I'm talking about New Brunswick. And then I'm ending my kind of time frame at 1834, which is when slavery was um, when slavery ended uh, throughout the British Empire. And I forget what the other part of your qu earlier question was before the um, time How period. many um, enslaved oh, yes. people Thank you. approximately? I, I, like, I think your thesis was something like 1,200 to 2,000, something like that. Yeah, that... exactly. So that's okay. based on uh, Harvey Amani Whitfield's work. Um, okay. So in his... Uh, dictionary it's over there i should have brought them here emily's but... just turned towards the 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 entire wall of leather bound so, volumes you, you fit in very well emily because we're often <laughs> pointing to books that are on our shelves that the listener doesn't see because we don't actually have a video portion of this podcast we we, we what's posted on youtube is actually just a it's just the uh the sound lines uh, uh, yeah. i could gesture to this bookshelf but it's just communism so and socialism <laughs> so i won't gesture there just yet so your, do you call him your partner or your comrade? His uh, his, <laughs> his literature has been. Uh... <laughs> we'll we'll stick with partner for now. Maybe okay, one yeah, day. yeah, yeah, no, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's off starting to start the revolution, by which Emily means plugging in the new router. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I did that by myself. Oh, sorry, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. He's um, at a concert. I had to text him what to do. <laughs> oh, I see. It's it's probably a Billy Bragg concert or something similar. Listen, don't worry. <laughs> something appropriately left. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so so that gives us a sense of the kind of the scale of this. Um, and I think just one of the things that in your thesis that you you mentioned a couple of times was that um, there's this I, I think you called it an historic amnesia mm -hmm. about yeah. um about uh, enslaved people in Canada at large. Um, or in New Brunswick specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, one of the things that Ken and I were interested in is just um, the the what caused you to, um, so you mentioned that you recognized this when um, Shermaine Nelson said in a class, how many people knew about this? Mm -hmm. um, but how did you address that historic amnesia in your thesis? So basically, so if there's this invisibility, where do you where do you find it? Where yeah. where does it become visible? How did you make and, it visible? And for those of us who grew up at a certain time, and Emily, I don't know if you remember like the Heritage Minutes mm -hmm. uh, playing on TV all the time, but like to the point that, you know, like Gabe and I've talked about these a couple of times as sort of trope or absence of slavery or it's a gentler slavery in Canada, basically, yeah. that was gone. You know, we don't learn about slavery, but you, you have this Heritage Minute sort of talking about all of these people escaping to Canada through the Underground Railroad. And it's a very feel good story that, you know, this is a refuge for people uh, during a dark time. And, and in fact, you know, it was not so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, those are both great questions and points to bring up. So I feel like to make visible, um, like through my thesis, this idea of slavery. And also, I just want to preface to that the knowledge of Canadian slavery. So like historical amnesia, going back to this, uh, Stuart Hall and whatnot, but also this idea that 
it's a historical amnesia, but for um, certain people. So for, yeah, for most people who are going in, in elementary school and high school, they're not learning about this. But for people who are part of these communities, uh, Black people whose ancestors were enslaved or Indigenous people whose ancestors were enslaved, uh, they have, through oral history and through books and research and community outreach, like they they know about this, like they're like slavery was happening in Canada. But this idea that the general um, public isn't learning about it in textbooks, I don't think one time I've ever read about slavery in Canada growing up. Uh, the only book I ever read was like an American girl's book about the Underground Railroad. Like so, from the American Girl Dolls? Is that the... Yeah. I yeah, think yeah. They, they had like a book series and it was um, about the Underground Railroad in Canada as this idea of freedom. And I think that a way that not just myself, but other scholars have made um, slavery in Canada and in their research more visible is by also dismantling. So it's kind of like this, there's a few fa phases in like the historiography. So in how slavery in Canada has been written about. So kind of First was the denial that it ever happened. It was like, no, slavery in Canada didn't happen. Then there was, okay, wait, no, slavery in Canada did happen, but it wasn't as bad as the US or it wasn't as bad as the Caribbean. And then there was like the more recent turn of scholars, I would say like starting in like 1990s and so on to today have been making slavery visible in a way that dismantles not only the trope that slavery didn't exist, but also that slavery was uh, more mild than the U.S. And that's why I think when I'm thinking of the research of Charmaine Nelson or Fua Cooper or, or uh, Har 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 Harvey Amani Whitfield, <laughs> I'm thinking of the way that they're um, bringing humans back into the story. So they're talking about specific individuals and their lived experiences and not kind of hitting um, Canada and the U.S. against each other but instead putting them in dialogue with one other Canada in the Caribbean, uh, whichever place you want to take. Um, and by considering different forms of uh, violence or similar forms of violence that we just didn't, that we most, well, in elementary and high school, we didn't learn about uh, in Canada, but that in university courses you might've come across, but just kind of thinking more critically about um, how the, how slavery in Canada wasn't just a placing kind of placing a blame on the U.S. is like, oh, you're the worst. It's like, no, like Canada, you're just as bad. And I think that's this whole propaganda that we have kind of go surrounding Canada as like the land of freedom. Um, so I think that for me, I tried to also make it visible in a similar way by talking about individual people and their stories um, and piecing together as much information as I could. Yeah, and, to, and, some, yeah. and some of that emerged too with like, um, you you talk about how basically when you actually when people started talking to the black community about slavery in Canada, you know, it was like, oh, just because it's a mild form of slavery, uh, you know, descendant communities still think about it. it it's still slavery. Like, I, you mm -hmm. know, like you're I, I, like black community members basically pointing out, that, no, it's still slavery. It does, doesn't matter how what kind of slavery it is. It's the point that, you know, this was taking place and this has kind of been washed away in a way that's 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 really problematic yeah absolutely I think um that was a quote by there's a quote in there by Joseph Drummond I believe who was like a I might be saying have his name mixed up with someone else but I'm pretty sure it's in um the Blacks of New Brunswick in that book where I want to say one second now I need to I just want to find what his name is the listener so, can't see this but Emily is turning to her letter bound bookcase uh, yeah, she's <laughs> camping out her pipe as she as she reaches for the leather brown book, and is is checking the bibliography of. It, she has one of those very it, nice leaded page holders as well. It's an enormous she's... book, listener. I, I yeah. the it's uh it's it's on is it on a book wheel? It seems to be on a book wheel. Right? She's got one of those medieval book wheels. It's, it's coming towards her. It's this collection of uh, of books. <laughs> and I found it. <laughs> as the as the wheel has just come to a stop, it's like a wheel of fortune. It's parked. Emily has put the brake on the wheel. Here it is. Um, so it was Robin Winks. Oh no, I'm a liar. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's a spray, William Spray, uh, the Blacks in New Brunswick. And this okay. book has also been um reissued in an edited volume, I believe, with a forward by members of 
um, the New Brunswick Black community, if I'm not mistaken. And in this book, he actually talks with um, community members. This I this book was written. It was written at some point. It was written. It doesn't matter when it was written, really, right we'll, now. We'll put it in the show notes. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. it was Joseph Drummond. So I had it right. Cool. Um, and he was a civil rights activist and a very important member in the New Brunswick Black community. Uh, he died in 1975. And he was um, a quote that um, Ken just paraphrase, paraphrase, talking about um, telling anyone that any form of slavery is mild, in my thinking, tantamount to a doctor telling a woman she has a mild form of pregnancy, to hold any human being being in servitude, no matter how kind the owner is or was, is a gross denial of all that is godly and decent. Slavery and discrimination have no varying degrees of severity. Um, and I think that that's very important to remember, especially in the context of Canadian slavery or also slavery when we're thinking of uh, in the U.S. North. Um, I think that the U.S. North, I, I know that the U.S. North also has this kind of historical amnesia as this place where, oh, enslaved people were escaping from the South to the North. Um, but like in Canada and like in the U.S. North, while enslaved people were escaping to those places, enslaved people were also escaping from those places. Um, so slavery was happening at the same time. So you've opened up a, a number of points we're going to return to, I think, because the uh, one of the things that I think is very exciting about your thesis is that it's incredibly humane. At the at sort of at the end of it, you find you you really find the individual, which I think is one of the kind of the powers of of history, right? In mm -hmm. um in a way that sometimes archaeology can't do. I think historians sometimes are able to really pull out particular individuals, and so I want to return to that with the case of Station Dick, which we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, but just at a a particular kind of methodological level um how did you go about finding these people in the archives or in maps or all these kinds of to sort of tell the listener and tell ken and i what you did and and but before we do that actually oh, one sorry, of the things sorry. that i think would be helpful for the listener is to contextualize the relationship between the groups that we call the black loyalists mm -hmm. and the groups uh the and the enslaved black populations that came mm -hmm. with the loyalists and how they relate to one another if there's overlap between those populations and how free black loyalists mm -hmm. if there if you came across any like interaction between these two groups basically mm -hmm. yeah for sure um gabe remember your question <laughs> well don't worry <laughs> yeah because now i'm gonna go on a whole uh, it's written down thankfully yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to uh address ken's question first so yeah, uh, that's a really great point to bring up um, and to contextualize kind of this historical context for, I was going to say the readers, but the listeners. Um, well, it should be readers. Is your your thesis is not embargoed, right? Or is it? It is, it is. Oh, it is. How long is it embargoed for? Um, Two years. But you're going to publish on it before then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the goal. Great. That's why it is embargoed. I'm not... Okay. Good. There's no secrets in there. Good, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So during the same time that we have Black enslavement, we also have a free Black population. Um, so there are, so I'm a bit, sometimes I'm a bit hesitant to call them Black loyalists. So essentially what has been traditionally written about Black loyalists um, in a, in basic terms is Black loyalists were people who fought for the British during the American Revolution because they were promised their freedom. Um, so they were granted their freedom at the end of the American Revolution in Canada. Um, so they fought for the British, remained loyal, were like migrated to Canada, and they were given their freedom. And what's important to note in my critical thinking, I think, of this idea of Black loyalists is this idea of were they really loyalists? Like, did they want to be loyal to the British crown? or they were doing this to attain freedom. They were doing this um, for their freedom at the end of the day. Um, I think just to keep it simple, uh, clearer, I think in what I'm saying now, I'll just refer to them as black loyalists or the free black community. And I'll refer to enslaved people as uh, black enslaved people when I'm talking about these specific two groups. And so at the same time that you have loyalists bringing enslaved people to New Brunswick, you have um, black loyalists, so white loyalists bringing enslaved people, sorry, to New Brunswick, and then you have black loyalists who are also coming to New Brunswick, but who have a, who are free. They have a free status. 
And what's interesting at this time is that they were still discriminated against. Um, they were given, they were never given title to their land. So they were granted land, but they weren't given title to it. They had to pay uh, rent for their land and they were purposely given smaller plots of land um, that was um, less fruitful. So it was harder to- um, Poor conditions, just harder to grow exactly. things. And, yeah. Exactly, thank you. Yeah. And um, essentially, um, they were also, like enslaved people, multi-occupational, not in the sense that they were enslaved, but they were doing many different um, jobs. Sometimes this was working as indented servants for um, white people, so whether it be white loyalists or um, other groups that were in the Maritimes at that time. And um, other times they were, they they did thrive, though. That's an important thing to note, that Black communities did still thrive in these spaces. So it wasn't always this idea that they were, they were being oppressed, but they were also thriving communities. They were built, if you can think of, um, there, there's examples in New Brunswick too, but that what comes to mind right away is like Africa and Nova Scotia, yeah. um, Birchtown, all these other places. So there were thriving communities. And to your second point of like interactions between the two, so I think that also kind of leads into what Gabe was asking after, but we do have a, a, a archival evidence of a free, free Black people or indentured um, Black people who were interacting with enslaved Black people. Uh, in fact, I had to, for sake of space, I had to cut out um, one example from my thesis, but it was uh, Major John Coffin who had, I want to say like five to seven enslaved people, I believe. And his property was directly next to um, Richard. I'm going to say his last name incorrectly, but it's, uh, we could correct it in the in the notes for the uh, podcast. But Richard Karankapoon, who was um, kind of a a leader in the within the Black community, who um, I don't know if we want to get into the Sierra Leone Company, but. Um, he was part of the Sierra Leone company. And was already uh, fit right into this podcast. And <laughs> well, well, do we want to yeah. talk about the Sierra Leone? They will be discussing uh, slavery in, in Paraguay by the time the yeah, yeah, exactly. is over at, at three in the morning. <laughs> so anyway, he was uh, a leader within the Black community. He was um, uh, a free Black, if you want to say, loyalist. And uh, he owned land and his... Um, not... not uh, I guess his community, but he was kind of like head petitioner for land. So you, you kind of had like one person apply for the land um, who had like a good status and you had other people that were kind of applying with him. So the people that were applying with him were all free black loyalists. So the questions of, of we have to question and think critically, of course, these enslaved people who live directly next to a free black community must have in some way had interactions with this community. And there's evidence that um, some of John Coffin's indented servants who were Black were escaping. So it's kind of questioning whether, oh, were they escaping to go and hide within this free Black community right next to them? Or what was this kind of um, desire for freedom that they could see directly next to them having an impact on their lives? Yeah. The, uh, so there's a series of, of new questions <laughs> No, <laughs> that, that's inspired. But, but I, I think we should just return to for a moment to kind of the basic question, um, which I think I elegantly phrased earlier as "What did you do?" Um, oh, so yeah. You, yeah. You, uh, what, yeah. What and how did you do? Yeah. Before yeah, yeah. I rudely so, interrupted Gabe's question. That's, no, uh, no. Ken's Ken's question was crucial to to um, uh, exposition for this question. I think, but yeah. the uh, it all kind of pegs back to I think we were wondering a bit just about how the the kind of methods you used to um, address this invisibility and some of the uh, just how you found out what you found out yeah for sure so um I started by doing historical research and secondary sources so I think um what my holy grails are always Harvey Amani Whitfield's books since he catalogs a lot of uh, archival material that I was interested in looking at so then what that's I that's where the I... listener should start would be yeah Whitfield okay yeah Harvey Amani Whitfield um, if you're thinking of uh, doing research for, on the Maritimes, and then if you're thinking of doing research more on Quebec, I would suggest uh, Marcel Trudeau. Okay. Um, Could you give us the name of Whitfield's book? I remember you you had a copy with you in the field, and I. Yeah. One second. Emily's returning to her um, <laughs> to her leather bound shelves. The listener can't see this. Emily's gone to the shelves. 
she's pulling Harvey Armani's uh, Whitfield's leather brown book from the shelves and she's coming back. So she's still carrying the book. Is it the blacks on the border one? She has the book. She's returning. It's leather bound. Oh, she has three oh, books. Several books. She's a handful of books. <laughs> so each of them leather bound. <laughs> and what are the books, Emily? So she's spinning heart. the 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 book wheel again here. Book wheel's on the move. <laughs> <laughs> So for um, Harvey Amani Whitfield, I would recommend uh, North to Bondage, Loyalist Slavery okay. in the Fair Times. And the listener and... cannot see it's a it's the leather bound book with with it's like sixty leather uh, leather posted. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. then also uh, he published this in twenty twenty two Biographical Dictionary of Enslaved uh, Black People in the Maritimes. Okay. okay. And then for um, uh, Quebec and more French Canada. Canada's Forgotten Slaves, 200 Years of Bondage by Marcel Trudeau. Okay. And Great. also The Hanging of um, Angelique, The Untold Story of Canadian Slavery and the Burning of Old Montreal by Fleur Cooper. Okay. Yeah. But, okay. Um, but the interesting listener should start with Whitfield, you think? Uh, Yeah. No, So yeah. that'd be North to Bondage. North to Bondage, yeah. Okay, the Biographical excellent. Dictionary is um a good place to start if you're in, interested in doing like more in-depth research if you kind of already have a background on it or else you're just kind mm-hmm. of looking at a list of of names and information gotcha. yeah um so your research oh. included extensive work in the archives uh it included um so yours was a very place-based thesis um use a lot of maps you so the listeners should know emily actually helped me out enormously i, I had a homework assignment for a, a graduate certificate i'm doing <laughs> And I needed someone to teach me how to look up um, places, basically, in the archives. And Emily walked me through this. So, what were you doing? What did you, What did you do? What's What's the What were you? How were you finding enslaved and, people on this landscape when they're often so obviously obscured? And as somebody who's in a geography department, this this thesis also would have fit very well as a geography, like a human geography thesis, basically. Like a, it it fits well within that rubric. So yeah, Lethbridge, there would have been three departments fighting over you. Here it was only two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, for sure. So uh, once I kind of got in the archives using Whitfield's books and finding archival documents um, on these enslaved people, so a lot of times this was uh, future slave advertisements or wills. What I did afterwards was I kind of went through the process. Of course, I had a large list at the beginning, um, but looking at the property the estates, so the land, I should say, that uh, enslaved people, uh, sorry, no, the land that loyalist uh, enslavers had in New Brunswick. So I was looking at their land petition. So that's land that they were petitioning to receive in New Brunswick and their land grant. So that was the land that they're actually granted in New Brunswick. And at first I thought that it kind of ended there. Um, But then I was like, oh no, I should look at the deeds. So I had to go through all the deeds for this land. So what um sorry not for this land but for each loyalist enslaver and their land so what land they purchase and so on and then I started slowly mapping that on um, ArcGIS so I imported data from GONB which is accessible to all listeners um you can find it on their website so it's just the cadastral maps so that's um, historical maps that kind of show the division of land um in New Brunswick and there's also a cadastral maps for other places, but that's not what I'm talking about. And I kind of traced over um, those parcels of lands by making a shape file. So I just imagine like I just kind of drew a shape over it um, to trace the boundaries of the land. And I kind of just added to that the more land I found, or I kind of, if land was uh, only owned by an enslaver for like a year and then they sold it, I kind of just, I, I took that out because I wasn't really considering that because a lot of the time the land would just stay vacant. Um, so I started doing that kind of desktop survey. Um, and then afterwards I was c- turning off the cadastral map layer and then looking at the satellite imagery to see kind of, is it possible to do archeology span there? Which is what Gabe was talking about where he said like, you could do archeology span now essentially. Um, so I kind of found sites where it could be possible to do archeology. span um, There's also sites that are just ginormous. Uh, like the one I had to cut John Coffin, I think it was like 6,000 acres. But then you have smaller sites which are like 900 acres, which is still a huge amount of land when you think of it. Um, but you can also kind of pinpoint more closely where um, there are features 
Um, and that's also not just through archival research on microfilm. So I was using a lot of microfilm research, but also through like oral histories, which is something that I think uh, that's my, what my PhD will touch more upon. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so I think this idea of, of sort of space and place was was really powerful in your thesis. And one of the things that um, I wondered if you could kind of riff on, and that seemed to me to be like a theme in your thesis was you talk about, you know, in in Fredericton, there is, I think it's, is it the Odell example, which supposedly mm -hmm. in the basement, there were shackles for enslaved people. Um, and so I think kind of metaphorically that like invokes this idea of slavery being really obscured or maybe even deliberately obscured um, or kind of erased, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could just talk about some of the places that you found, like if you just give us some um, interesting places, some powerful places, um, some be visible places of mm -hmm. um, Black enslavement um, here in New Brunswick. For sure. Just give me one sec. Okay, there you go. I see my data table <laughs> to help me remember. Um, so yeah, I think uh, you're um, putting together two different enslavers. So there's- Oh, shoot. No, that's okay though. They're both very similar. So Odell, Jonathan Odell's house is in Fredericton, which you're right about. And there were supposedly um, chains and shackles for enslaved people, but that was in um, the um, extension. So the L that was torn down. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and then the basement is James Scoville, who's in uh, Kingston, Kings County at the Anglican Trinity Church that had the basement um, with also with supposedly shackles for enslaved people. And, and, and that's the place that's well? the National Historic Site. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Odell's is not a historic site. Um, although, o like, there's a plaque for Odell there, which it should be a historic site, but... I digress. I'll get <laughs> I'll get upset. <laughs> cool. So I, um, I had some I had some notes actually about uh, about some of the protections and stuff like that. But I, I that might be for a different conversation that we have about uh, uh, heritage protections and mm -hmm. what gets designation and stuff like that. But that's a Absolutely. different conversation, maybe. And what yeah. what gets torn down? Anyways, yeah, I can talk about that too, <laughs> but another time. <laughs> Um, so so now that we've thoroughly embarrassed ourselves on 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 the places, um, we no, want to no, no, no. straight and give us some hits here on uh, on <laughs> on what are some what are the kinds of places that we should be interested in archaeologically or in terms of material culture. Yeah, so um, there's sites like uh, Jonathan Odell, which we just talked about, James Scoville, which I briefly mentioned, um, and then there's Stair Agnew, who's in St. Mary. So just I guess kind of it's in Barker's Point now, which isn't really considered for action, but it's on the north side. It's just next to it or kind of like part of the municipality, I think. Um, anyways, and he also has- We have at least uh, one listener in Barker's Point, so be careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they can correct me. That's okay. <laughs> and um, he also had um, supposedly, according to a newspaper article that was talking about the destruction of the uh, living quarters of enslaved people at Jonathan O'Dell's house. Simultaneously mentioned, oh, there's other another site with uh, living quarters used by enslaved people on Stair Agnew's old property that was also torn down. So we have this idea that there are sites that were actively being destroyed. So when we think of O'Dell and Agnew, and then we have James Scoville, which is still standing. So it's the basement of a church um, that you can go see today that has, um, according to the... Um, historical designation that it has the ovens in situ that ha um that his accord that his enslaved people were using uh which were robert and samson and also uh, apparently a um skull was found in the floorboard uh many years ago when they were doing some construction there um i don't know what happened with the skull um it could be related to um west african burial practices it could be completely unrelated um, to the site as well, but not to uh, dismiss that. I just don't want to uh, get into that right now because I don't know what happened to it and, and I don't have enough information. But then we also have potential sites like Caleb Jones, uh, who owned, uh, who um, sorry, who enslaved 11 people uh, in St. Mary's. And then we have Jacob Elgood, who enslaved nine people in Prince William and Dumfries. 
And then we have other people like Sarah Corey, um, who's one of the women loyalists I talk about in my thesis, who enslaved at least three people uh, in Gagetown. And these are sites that, although there's no record of there being so-called separate slave quarters um, on their property, um, I question whether if you had 11 enslaved people, uh, as in the US North, when you had a higher number of enslaved people, it was too cramped to live with your family that was often eight people, wife, kids, so on, um, to have the enslaved people also living within that space, the same space as your family. So you would often have designated living quarters. So kind of questioning, okay, although we don't have records like Odell or Scoville in articles or on maps, can we think more about there could be these spaces that were just, like we said, rendered invisible. Um, so also it's kind of a, like all archaeology is a little bit of a treasure hunt, I guess, trying to find these spots. Um, the in, the also, invisibility yeah. is an interesting thing, though, because you talk about, too, how um, it's not just that the structures themselves are difficult to see, but that, like, the material culture of enslaved people was, um, you know, tended to be more ephemeral, more subject to uh, taphonomic basically break down because they were given poor materials in their clothing. They had fewer personal items and that sort of stuff. And so it's, it's even more challenging archeologically to not you, it's difficult to not just to find the spaces, but also some of the material culture associated with these activities. But you kind of hint at some of these places where you might be able to find some of this evidence. So did you want to talk, I think it was the Odell example where you talked about there's sort of these traffic areas where you might expect to find um, mm -hmm. some of the activities of of enslaved people. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great point to bring up because there's not all hope is lost. <laughs> um, there You can still find material. So I talk about, I use an example from uh, Massachusetts. So it's the um, Royal House slave quarters that uh, Alexandra Chan wrote about and did excavations at uh, with a few other people. And I kind of use it as a broad comparison since um it was um, an ens a white enslaving family who enslaved um, a number of enslaved people, but kind of, I guess you can say on the lower end than what you would think of compared to slavery in the South, where there was like hundreds and hundreds of enslaved people on the plantation. And what she finds is that within the yards of enslaved people's living quarters, so just the just out outside, um, people know what a yard is. I don't have to explain that, I think. <laughs> but <laughs> just outside their living space and if emily keeps up she can replace you on this podcast <laughs> yeah she didn't say door yard though she didn't That's, say door yard. Uh, then <laughs> that would need some expl explanation for those of us outside the maritime so. i i remember learning about that in gabe's class <laughs> so, <laughs> um but yeah so in the yards it was like a hub of activities so they were finding um disposal pits they were finding pipe stems so so uh, evidence of leisure and social activities they were finding um uh thimble like sewing material they were finding children's toys so this was happening in massachusetts so although let's say for odell's example the extension where the enslaved people were living was unfortunately um torn down um, within the yard, so within, outside of the space, we could still, uh, there could still be archaeological evidence of enslaved people's activities that can kind of shed light onto um, not only what they were doing for their diet and their food ways, but also what they were doing for their leisure or as their kind of second shift work. So thinking of enslaved women um, or how children were experiencing uh, enslavement in New Brunswick. Um, so yeah, kind of in these yard spaces. And I think that that goes for um, all the case studies I talked about once we kind of find maybe a more precise spot um, where there could be a feature um, where we could find within these so like these surrounding yards um, archaeological evidence that attests to kind of sheds light onto the realities of enslaved people in New Brunswick. So if we can return for a moment, uh, one of the things you've you've talked about the kind of family scale of human interactions, um, and I remember during your defense. Um, Professor Hunt Kennedy pointed out that that you know sort of accepting death one of the biggest um, kind of threats to um, an enslaved person was this idea of family separation, mm -hmm. and so as a result, this uh, it became important to maintain community ties among different 
um, places, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was kind of reminded when you were talking about this about the idea, you know, on in the plant on plantations in the American South about uh, plantation neighborhoods, right? Enslaved people among different plantations interacting. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the kinds of communities that, that enslaved people and Canada actually talked about this a little bit and um, uh, Black people who were not enslaved, the way in which they maintained communities and what those communities looked like. Mm -hmm. For sure. I, and I think uh, if you want me to get into the example of Dick and Stasia. Absolutely. Yeah. You, yeah. You, okay. You, 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 foresaw my, you foresaw where I was going. With <laughs> okay. <that. laughs> I thought so. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's an excellent question because um, beyond thinking about enslaved people who were um, likely living together and how they were interacting. So uh, before I get to the uh, the case study that Gabe desperately wants me to talk about, <laughs> um, I'll talk just briefly about like, for example, um, Jacob Elgood. So he had nine enslaved people and he had a very successful, I guess you can, not successful farm, not a plantation, but a successful farm in New Brunswick. And um, a few of his enslaved people were related and he brought them from, let me just remember, Elgood, not Elwood, the cat, Elgood, Virginia. Um, so he brought them from Virginia, he took them from Virginia to New Brunswick. So again, this idea, this is a different idea of like forced dislocation. Um, but you have people who um, were brother and sister, who are um, mother and child. Um, so you also have not only people with community bonds within um, within their enslaved community and within the people that they're living with, but you also have enslaved people and free mm -hmm. Black people um, forming bonds. And I think that an excellent example of this, although there were several um, that I that came up across my research and also that I had to just cut out of my thesis. But um, there was the example of Stasia and Dick. So Stasia was an enslaved woman uh, enslaved by Joseph Clark, who had at least eight enslaved people in Majorville. So just next to St. Mary's um, and in Sunbury County. So right next to York County. So very close still to this uh, city center. Um, and she was married which was not recognized, so not technically or formally married in the eyes of her enslaver to Dick Hopewell, who was a black indented servant. So um, an indented servant was someone who, uh, I should just clarify, contracted um, their labor to um, to someone else. Uh, in this case, it was Joseph Clark, who was a white loyalist. So they're not enslaved, however, and they do have different uh, experiences than enslaved people and indentured ships were different, but um, they were still um, abused and oppressed as well uh, on top of, and you can be a white and in, be an indentured servant. So it wasn't just um, black people. So a lot, you can think also in the Caribbean, like the Irish indentured and uh, indentured servitude. But anyways, I digress. Um, so Dick and Stasia, uh, had a and it's this gleam in his eyes that says, tell me more about, you know, the, let's, let's just wind this up. It's, I mean, it's only, you know, quarter past midnight. Why don't we, <laughs> why don't we talk about Ireland? Like I said, right. you're a natural, you're a natural fit. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we might have you on as the third host. The, uh... <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> um, yeah. So Dick and Stasia were married. And... Right, Emily, Emily, how do you feel about hockey? It's me ken, ken wants you to talk about the leafs for you know, <laughs> i don't know habs, much about she'd hockey. be a habs fan wouldn't i she? would i'm a i guess i'm a habs fan yeah for my dad i'm a habs fan yeah, yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> anyway it doesn't matter um yeah dick and stassi are married the first time i came across them was in a fugitive slave advertisement printed by joseph clark saying stassia uh requesting a reward and re requesting the capture and reenslavement of Stasia, um, who was at the time pregnant with two children, but carrying two children with her, an unnamed daughter and an unnamed son. And uh, her husband, who in the advertisement says um, Dick Hopewell, who claimed Stasia as his wife. So again, this idea of the word claim, like it's not um, a recognized marriage. They were escaping together. Um, and I was re did more research on them and 
it is possible that Stasia and Dick even came to New Brunswick together. So before they were enslaved by Joseph Clark, they were enslaved by someone named Gabriel Fowler, who had bought Stasia from um, an, ens an enslaver in New York. It's I forget his name, but it, it's not relevant right now. And um, instead of her name being Stasia in the Book of Negroes, uh, which is another primary source I use a lot in my research, uh, her name is Stash with um, her son, Joe. And she had a son, Joe, in New Brunswick, Stasia, when it's spelled Stasia, in archival records in New Brunswick. And then we also see a Richard, um, Gabriel Fowler is the enslaver, and then a Richard Fowler, who's coming as a servant. Um, and Harvey Monty Whitfield has also, also hypothesized this, that it's possible that Richard Fowler was, in fact, Dick Hopewell, because when you look at uh, archival evidence in deposition. So there were, uh, Stassi and Dick were involved in court cases. He talks about his life uh, being formerly enslaved in Virginia. And um, the archival evidence from the Book of Negroes testifies that he was formerly enslaved in Virginia as Richard um, Fowler. Uh, so he took the last name of his enslaver at the time. Um, and you see these two people um, having children together, being married, um, and forming close community bonds that they value deeply that they were escaping likely to keep these bonds together because um, as a punishment, whether it was because of their escape or because of something that happened prior, Stasia and her children uh, were separated um, and family separation was a form of trauma and abuse that enslavers often inflicted. Um, and we find out that Dick, as a strategy to kind of stay with Stasia and to stay with uh, some of her children were did stay with her, but most of them were separated and sold to different enslavers, one of them being Stare Agnew that I also talk about in my thesis. Um, he goes and um, indentures himself to the enslaver that she sold to. So there's like this connection of them trying to stay together. So one of the things though that you you talk about uh in 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 terms of maintaining this uh these relationships, you know, even in the face of family separation that I thought was really um interesting was the concept of rival geographies. Mm -hmm. And yeah, your examples yeah, like in particular um focus on the Wolstock River and the ways in which this may have been understood essentially in different ways by um indigenous people, of course, and then um loyalists and then um enslaved people and i wondered if you could uh just elaborate on that a bit because i thought it was a a, a good use of that idea yeah for sure so um rival geographies is um i mean it, it goes back to edward said but in the context that i'm using it it's um from a book by stephanie camp uh, i could find the title later but she talks about enslaved uh women black enslaved women's experiences and how they created rival geographies. So rival geographies was kind of, it was a space where um, it could have been a hidden space or a known, like a hidden space being somewhere in deep in the woods or a known space, the like their living quarters, like the so their so-called slave quarters, where they were um, finding a place away from their enslaver, even though it was still partially under the control of their enslaver, but where they were finding room um, not only to um, have lived ex uh, lived experiences and with each other, but also a place where they could have been um, plotting their escape. So I use the example for Caleb Jones, who had 11 enslaved people. A number of them escaped together. Um, one of the most famous cases that listeners might be familiar with and that a lot of people in New Brunswick are familiar with now is the case of Nancy. Um, who escaped with, I believe, four other enslaved people and later went to court for her freedom, uh, but was unsuccessful, unfortunately. And um, I talk about rival geographies in the sense that um, they could have been using their living quarters as a space to plot their escape. And also how uh, enslaved people, so another person enslaved by Caleb Jones was Lidge, used um, the Wolostuk as the Rolastic River, I should say, as um, a rival geography to kind of escape their enslavers. So they're using the waterways, they're using their knowledge of, they were make, likely making boats. Enslaved people were often making um, different types of small boats and they were using their knowledge of the waterways in the sense that 
they probably were if their Caleb Jones lived on the north side, they were going to the south side where the market was to sell their produce. So they had knowledge of these waterways and how they were strategically using um, their maritime literacy, which is um, what some what scholars have coined it uh, to escape and kind of the Willowstick being a site of also where people were forming allyships and um, rival geographies along the coast. So we had... There's another example, I might be thinking of Nova Scotia or Quebec, but where an enslaved person, an enslaved person is recorded escaping from her enslaver. Um, she used a ladder to like climb out the, like he knew exactly what her plan was. She used a ladder to climb out her window window and was seen getting on a canoe uh, with another black person. We're, we don't know who the other black person was, but also how um, the river was a site of a rival geography and how it was used strategically in ways um, for allyships, escapes, and also to maintain community bonds. So for Stasia, she could have used the river to go see um, her son take a boat upriver. Her son lived, when, while she was with Joseph Clark, her son was with Stair Agnew. Um, and they weren't, they were very close to one another. I can't remember exactly, but there was ways to use the river to also maintain community bonds. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's I thought it was great. It's also sort of just like a like a fascinating throughput of like, you know, like Wabanaki using Wallastog as like, you know, a, a means of communication and connection mm -hmm. and 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 also sort of a way to negotiate um, changing world in the contact period too, right? Like sort of they knowledge of the river systems help them negotiate and sort of outmaneuver Europeans in many ways, um, but also kind of show them uh, and and Europeans using the river too. You talk about how um uh loyalists basically kind of branched out along the lost oak over mm -hmm. time but yeah yeah it's it, it was a uh it's a particularly evocative way to think through um uh, uh engaging with the landscape right and and the different ways that people did sort of practice within that landscape and mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah Completely experiences agree. of places that's uh you know yeah as, as gabe pointed out very place driven it's it's uh <laughs> I enjoyed yeah. that. Um, the uh, well, the listener should know that that uh, Emily is is getting to the bottom of her Covassier spritz, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, so can I? Do you? Um, I've I've uh, this is I admit my second stab at this. What really is just an astonishing piece of work. So I wonder, can do you do you have anything you want to follow up on before we, um, before we ask Emily for her final thoughts? Um, the the only thing I. I... Critical fabulation, uh, I, I thought was just a, a fascinating term. I've mm -hmm. never come across that before. Um, can you give us like the two, two second summary of critical fabulation and, and um, maybe maybe an example of how you used it in your work mm -hmm. um, and, and how others might and how the, the sort of the power of the storytelling that you can do with critical fabulation? Yeah, absolutely. So um, critical fabulation is um, a theory and method used by and developed by or coined by, I should say, Sadia Hartman. Um, and she, the way that I use it as a form as more as a form of inspiration. So critical fabulation is using um, archival and historical records that are supplemented with um, critical but fictional narrative to kind of not fill in the gaps, but to make sense of a story and to think of what could have happened. Um, and I think I what I carry with that is this idea of what could have happened or what could have been said. Um, and instead of, since I'm not kind of writing um, like a, a, a literary piece, uh, in that sense, I use it as a kind of a jumping off point. So it inspired me to think of ways that um, we can kind of, I, I guess like read against the archival grain, but also beyond that. So by using archeological material to think about, okay, we have written sources that talk about these enslaved people running away and what their experiences were, uh, but what could these future, hopefully um, archeological records tell us like what could have happened, what could have been said, especially because uh, enslaved people were often illiterate. So they didn't leave behind their own written sources. Um, so I use it, critical fabulation as like a source of inspiration in my work. Um, and then I think that it's throughout all the kind of theoretical and methodological people I cite on, they all go back to Sadia Hartman and this 
um, idea of kind of critically trying to fill in the gaps um, within the archives. I hope that was clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally. That, that, that's thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the um, so uh, Emily, Emily Drakio, it's been a which will say your whole name. I think this is how I, I've heard this on radio. <laughs> this is where we we loop back to introduce you again. We so we, we say, well, Emily Drakio, it's been an immense pleasure to have you um, on the podcast. And what's the name of your thesis again? Oh. Excavating, oh, she has to look it up. No, I don't. Excavating archives, mapping enslaved people, and locating their living quarters in Loyalist era New Brunswick or in Excellent. New Brunswick's Loyalist landscape. There we go. <laughs> and, and just so the listener can situate, um, so you've mentioned an upcoming PhD project, but mm -hmm. you also shared with us that you are um, sort of an, a freshly minted employee of a of a heritage institution in Montreal now. Yeah. So. Um, Right now I'm working as a, an intern at the Pointe à Calier Museum, so the Montreal Museum of Archaeology and History as a material culture specialist. So um, working with one of their historic period sites in Montreal in the 1830s, right after slavery ended actually, but it'll still be very interesting. I'm really excited, looking forward to that. And then the PhD would be to kind of extend my research um, on New Brunswick by doing community archaeology, or also I'm considering um, kind of expanding the regional scope of my work um, to Quebec, because I find um, slavery in Quebec very interesting as well. And and field work in New Brunswick daunting. Yes, <laughs> field work <laughs> anywhere daunting, I think. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's safe to assume that there'll be a publication somewhere fairly soon about this thesis. Absolutely. And, and when it comes out, you'll... <laughs> you'll loop us in so we can we can keep our listeners abreast of it yeah, yeah for sure Excellent. you too Good. can become a hit piece <laughs> <laughs> well ken on that note i think we are looking at half finished bottles of covassier <laughs> and, uh, i think so uh, and um congratulations on the thesis emily it was very very good and we really appreciate you coming on um you're sort of our first formal interview on the New Brunswick. Uh, well, that's not quite true. We did a, a thing with Bill uh, Farley about publishing, but you're sort of our first um, topical interview. That's that you're the 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 whole guest star for the show. It's a, sort of, it's a new format for us, and so we appreciate you bearing with us. And you're kicking off our second season. Oh, that's I awesome! Think. Yeah, yeah, that's freaking awesome. It's a pleasure. I'm really happy I could do this. Yeah, well, we're, well, we're very happy to have had you. Thank you for coming on. <laughs> Um, and best of luck with the new job. And um, we will have you on again sometime to talk about the future stage of this research and maybe about what you're doing at the museum there in Montreal. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Emily. And we've got some actually some pretty exciting ones. We it's the last two episodes. I feel like this has been sort of harvest season for the um, Northeast archaeologists. Really, there's been a lot to read, a lot of good stuff out there. Yeah, um, yeah, busy a busy schedule. We actually had to split these hit pieces into two to get them. Did yeah, that's right, listener. It's a biblical solution here in uh, New Brunswick archaeology to, to <laughs> kind of sort this out. Um, but I think our our first um, uh, hit piece is. And we should actually, we should, you know, at some point we should really get Marla on to talk NAGPRA with us. It's occurring to me as I read this, but um, yeah, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Marla Taylor, who um, runs the collections at the Robert S. Peabody um, Institute in um, Andover, Massachusetts, um, where I've done a fair bit of research. And Marla's actually, in addition to being at the Robert S. Uh, Peabody, she is a um, adjunct faculty member here in the Department of Anthropology at UNB, has a blog post up on creating an indigenous collections care guide. And so uh, Marla is a uh, sort of leading scholar on the topic of basically collaborative collections management. So um, Fantastic. she and her institute um, are, uh, are, are pioneers basically in um, a whole bunch of kind of what we would think of maybe as collaborative archaeology, but it's in the collection space. And I would encourage you to check out this um, blog post that we'll throw in the show notes and uh, really check out actually Marla's work in general, which uh, is all really interesting. And she's a real insightful uh, museum studies scholar. 
Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, and uh, and also we should uh, we should post her the presentation she did for the APA and B on NAGPRA. Maybe we'll yes. add that to the show notes. We um, absolutely uh, excellent. It's about it an more. hour long lecture, folks, and and it was really fantastic, really well attended when she put it on. But uh, she sort of explains where NAGPRA came from, um, and some of the implications of it, and how sort of in contemporary. Uh, museum practice, uh, NAGPRA is sort of influencing um, uh, ongoing repatriate, repatriation efforts and and influencing things like these, like the Indigenous uh, Collections Care. So, Yeah, and we should just say real quick, uh, NAGPRA is a law in the United States. It's the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act. So yeah, it came in um, in 1990. Yeah. yeah um, Probably made it's... most famous by the Kennewick Man case, eh? I think so. Yeah, I think that's yeah. exactly what made it most famous. Um and I think, I mean, we don't need to just like get in the weeds on this, Ken, but I think we're both proponents of more federal legislation to cover archaeology in Canada. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Would and, not mind uh, something NAGPRA-esque here. Yeah. And and I mean, it, it also meant that we, you, had, you have TIPOs in the States, too, like Tribal Historic Preservation Officers were um, sort of created under the rubric of NAGPRA. Yeah, all that uh, all that kind of stuff that comes out of it. Um, yeah. And actually, just while we're on the Robert S. Peabody Institute, um, uh list here it's been a big uh big fall for them or a big late summer i guess for them um this article and we we showcased one of bonnie newsom's articles last week or last fortnight and um bonnie has really been putting out all sorts of good stuff and this time with it's uh ryan wheeler who is the director of the robert s Peabody institute in andover and bonnie newsom and they published a chapter called sacred places and contested spaces in maine the long shadow of colonial science in the light of repatriation and that's in Archaeological Papers of the American Anthropological Association. And this um, basically is also actually in a similar vein to Marla's article um, and deals, it's kind of a historical look at attitudes toward um, uh, basically continuity and relationships between contemporary Indigenous people and past Indigenous people and what that's meant for repatriation um, in the Northeast. Uh, highly recommend this article. Um, I am not sure if it's open access or not. I should should have checked that before we came on the air, but um, it's well worth the read. Yep. So that's and, um. Oh, go ahead, Ken. And then the the yeah, then the next one we have a paper uh, by a group out of the Smithsonian, uh, San Diego State University, Trent and uh, uh, Bonnie Newsom and um, uh, Torin Rick at the University of Maine. Uh, sort of a, a Rick's a at Smithsonian, group. but Bonnie's at. Uh, yeah, Emma Smith is at the Smithsonian. Uh, Paul, is it Spasic? Spock, I think. Spock, okay, yeah, at yeah. the university at San Diego State University. Todd Brahe at Trent, um, and basically they're do looking at a historical ecology study of uh, fifteen late Holocene archaeological um, swordfish remains. Um, and uh, uh, identifying basically the isotopic signatures of them and uh, um, some of the archaeological interpretations of how um, uh, basically these sort of apex predators operated and sort of feeding into the um, archaeological data pertaining to swordfish hunting. I'm guessing this is a lot of stuff that's like late archaic, eh? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Um, and I uh, highly recommend that article. And I think also we owe uh, Bonnie a congratulations. I think she maybe has had, uh, she's now at three hit pieces over two shows, probably a new record. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, well done. Very impressive. Yeah, uh, she's an impressive scholar. Um, and then, uh, but speaking of people who are friends of the show, um, we've got another uh, Nathaniel Kitchell uh, article here. And um, it's uh, Nathaniel Kitchell, Brady L. McDonald. Uh, Matthew, do you know, does he say his last name Bollinger or Boulanger? Oh, I've always thought Boulanger, but I, I've, I've never met him before. He's with Brandy at Murr, right? Uh you know, I'm I'm I thought he was at Southern Methodist, but all these people oh. have so many affiliations. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. So Brandy McDonald's the director of like the archaeology or archaeometry lab at uh, Missouri University Research Reactor. Oh yes, I think he did used to be there, so that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, and then Heather Rockwell, who's at uh, Salve, also a friend of the podcast. Um, and they did this is so Ken. I confess, I I read this article and I did not have a clue what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure it's very, very good. It's just uh, over my head, but it's preliminary results on the applicability of neutron activation analysis. That's NAA to identify church from the Monsungan Lake Formation, Maine, USA. Yeah. And so so the so neutron activation analysis for the listeners, basically, 
um, you crush up rocks into a small powder, you bombard them with like basically nuclear, um, uh, with like, uh, I don't know, atoms or something. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, essentially it is, it's what's called a quantitative analysis of stone. And so be, by crushing up stone and by analyzing the whole sample and bombarding it the way that you do with NAA, you get essentially parts per million counts of different elements within that rock. Um, and so it is sort of the, I think it's really kind of considered the gold standard in terms of sourcing. Um, the challenge there is that because it's a fairly, dis because it's a destructive process, you have to be really careful that you're not, um, uh, you're either getting consent if you're dealing with archaeological uh, material or uh, that the group that you're dealing with is uh, is aware that uh, the technique is is sort of fully destructive and irradiates whatever sample that you're you're uh, analyzing. So, but we did some neutron Fantastic. activation actually with uh, Washington Mocher with Brandy and her team, uh, and that information will be coming out probably in the next few months on on Carboniferous charts from New Brunswick. So similar technique. Well, that's great, and congratulations to um, all those authors, and we highly recommend um, all of their work. So, um, well, Ken, uh, it's a it's been a good. It's been a good fall for papers, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I hope and we, it's only uh, hope just we can, begun. I hope we continue to see, to see more getting pumped out. Me too. It's a, it's a good time to be a Northeast archaeologist, don't you think? I think so. I think so. Okay. Have a good night, listener, and we will see you in about a fortnight. Is that right, Ken? We're doing about that is a correct. Right yeah, and uh, and just to remind the listener, the the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast is brought to you every week or every fortnightly by the uh, Association of Professional Archaeologists of New Brunswick. Um, and we wanted to, uh, since we're starting the second season here, we wanted to uh, shout out again our, um, uh, our our sound engineers, I guess, or our um, uh, audio. Uh, they did our uh, music, our intro, our, and our score. Yeah. What, what's what? What are they called? Uh, theme song composers. The composers oh, yeah. of our uh, um, uh, of our the music that you hear on this show. Uh, Justin Hanke, um and Shane Dahl. Um, and uh, uh, Justin is uh, in a band that we wanted to highlight. Um, what is their name again? Uh, I you know I should know the exact name of his current band because he is my brother in law, but. Um... But you can find him at JustinTheLibrarian.com. Yes, yes. um, and Shane Dahl is a uh, um, postdoctoral fellow, Banting postdoctoral fellow um, at Harvard, but is actually um, here in Lethbridge University. He's a, a contract instructor here as well. And uh, so uh, I have the pleasure of seeing Shane uh, fairly frequently. Um, and he is a cultural anthropologist who studies um, uh, Buddhism uh, in uh, in uh, Japan. So um, thank you to Shane and Justin for providing that to the APNB for the sponsorship. And thank you listeners for coming back for a second season of the New Brunswick Archaeology podcast. We're looking forward to um, chatting with you for another, you know, I don't know, Ken, what do we do? 80 hours a season, something like that? Something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, is that what it was that really what it is? Well, I mean, we do 16 hours an episode, so <laughs> it adds up quick. <laughs> What's that in American minutes? It's uh, I think I think that's uh, eighteen minutes an episode. Yeah. The, uh, and Emily's a dual citizen, so she would know. She's um, she's she thinks in um, Fahrenheit and centigrade at all times. <laughs> all right, listener. Have a good night. Thank you very much, Emily. And Thanks, Emily. Uh, we'll talk to you in uh, Fortnite. See you later, listener. Thank you.